And uh, I'll hand over to Heather Lacey, uh, Marketing Executive and Chair of the Disability, Mental Health and Neurodiversity Group. Um, and from Heather Shed Sutherland, uh, over to you, Heather. Thanks, Sean. Really nice to see everyone today. Um, good morning. Hope you've all got a cup of coffee or a brew or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm Heather Lacey. I'm Marketing Executive at Evershed Sutherland and I chair the Pro Manchester Disability Mental Health and Neurodiversity Working Group. That is a mouthful. Um, so this event actually intersects with what we're trying to do um, with the working group. Um, in terms of awareness building and perception changing around mental health, mental illness, and all of that, that, that intersects with it. So I'm really thrilled to, to have the opportunity to introduce this. And I think this is gonna be a really informative and engaging session. Um, we all know that so many of us have had to face a lot of challenges, particularly recently. Um, so this event obviously couldn't have come at a better time. Um, in terms of what we do with the group, for those living with disability, chronic illness, neurodiversity, mental illness and mental health difficulties are all too common. So events like this, in terms of understanding resilience, um, are really crucial in helping people to, to sort of understand how to navigate those more challenging times, which unfortunately everyone goes through. So the session may be quite challenging itself, but um, what I will sort of signpost you to is that Pro Manchester have created um, a health hub. So this is a, a hub of information, events and blogs that help you manage mental health and well-being and also provide advice on where you can go to access um, further information if needed. So without further ado, um, welcome to the, the, uh, the webinar, the session, um, which is mental health and resilience in the face of adversity. So this will be hosted by Steve Renfrew, who is of Schroeder's Personal Wealth. Um, we'll also be hearing from Martin Hibbert, who's Synergy Sports Management and Trustee at the Spinal Injuries Association, and also Karen Casper of the North Care Charity. So following today's session, Sean, um, will send out a post-event email which will contain any post-event collateral, any links um, so you can find out about other Pro Manchester events and also our feedback form. Um, so if you could please fill this in, it will be really helpful for us to see where we might need to improve um, and also give us some, some great feedback for further sessions. So um, just a few points in terms of housekeeping. I'm sure we're all used to this by now in the world of Zoom and Teams. Um, please be aware this webinar is being recorded. Please feel free to use the chat function to ask questions, make comments, or if you have any observations, do feel free to pop them in there. And as Sean did say earlier, if you're not um, speaking please ensure that your microphone is on mute just to ensure we can hear um, from our, our wonderful speakers so um i think that's everything from me so without further ado i will hand you over to steve thank you heather good morning everybody thank you all for coming along we appreciate you uh, joining i'm steve renfrew i'm the regional director for schroeder's personal wealth uh, and i'm going to just be a gentle host uh, today and uh, help us through. Uh, at Schroeder's Personal Wealth we've got a very strong focus on well-being and obviously this fits very neatly into that and uh, mental health and uh, obviously in Covid times we, uh, uh, we're obviously uh, to, to various degrees um, being challenged by the situation we find ourselves in but I've had my jab, the sun's out and uh, I'm hopeful uh, of a brighter future and uh, I think actually uh, for the sit back and enjoy the next hour because I think you're in for an absolute treat. I'm completely biased because Martin's my pal, but uh, I think uh, this is he's one of the most inspirational uh, guys I've ever met. And uh, I think you will enjoy his story as harrowing as it is in parts. Um, just to uh, set the scene, really, uh, I was having a chat with uh, Sam Booth, uh, who many of you know about, you know, how do we help people through COVID? what kind of things are important. And we focused uh, with, our, with our theme at Schroeder's Personal Wealth on well-being, on mental health and, and picked out resilience as being a, 
a really important factor, not just existing in these times, but being resilient enough to to come out the other side and flourish. And when I thought about that, the person who characterised that the most was Martin. So uh, Martin's going to speak, I think, uh, just give you a frame for about uh, 20 minutes, maybe maybe a bit longer. Um, when I asked Martin what he'd do this for us, he said, yes, I will, but uh, on one condition, and that is that you help uh, and support uh, the uh, Salford Royal, who saved my life, really. And so uh, Karen's a friend of ours, and she's come along, and she's going to spend a few moments uh, just garnering a bit of help, really, see what you could do to help. Uh, with your connections, perhaps a bit of money, you never know, um, and uh, try and try and help along uh, the, the amazing people of the NHS who, who we're all grateful to at the moment. So uh, sit back and relax and enjoy Martin's story. 20 minutes, Martin, five or 10 minutes with Karen, and then uh, Martin wants to do some Q&A. So uh, as he goes, please get your questions ready. He's gonna do that at the end. So Martin, welcome. You're more than welcome to the main event. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate your time. Cheers, Steve, and uh, good morning to everybody. Th thanks for joining me today. Uh, <clears throat> just like to say uh, thank you, first of all, to Pro Manchester uh, for the invite uh, and the platform uh, to be able to speak to everybody today. Uh, and obviously, uh, Schroders uh, and my good friend, uh, Steve, uh, for the continued love and support that he's shown uh, over the last few years uh, and continues to do so. So it's uh, an honour to be here. Uh, and I'm really pleased to be able to put the spotlight not only on uh, mental health and, and my journey, which uh, some of you will have probably heard already, uh, but also uh, I'm really honoured uh, and, and pleased to be able to put the spotlight on Salford Royal today and uh, the North Care charity uh, for my good friend uh, uh, and school friend of 30 years, uh, Karen Casper. Uh, so yeah, we've, we've given our age away there, Karen. Um, as a lot of you will know, uh, Salford Royal is uh, a place very close to my heart because basically without them I wouldn't be here today. They, they saved my life um, and uh, I always think of uh, the, the great man, Mr Saxena, who'd already done a 12-hour shift driving home and then hearing what had happened on May the 22nd and instead of going home, drove around straight back to Salford Royal and operated on me for 14 hours. So like I say, just an amazing place wouldn't be here without them and today is for them you know what I mean so I will talk it's going to be a, a no fill to talk uh, so it will be upsetting in parts um, but it's something I'm very passionate about uh, especially mental health uh, so for the men on there today this is for you um, you know um, I think that there is still a stigma around mental health and I want to break that so today is about hopefully at the end of it you know we, we have the the confidence to speak up when we're not when we're not feeling well when we don't feel right um, so that that's what I want to get across today everything that I've been through I'm still here smiling so if I can do it you can do it and that's what I want from today um, so so yeah so my story actually begins uh, in January 2014 which is seven years ago now which seems like ages ago and I've not been feeling great for a while uh, and I'd, I'd, I'd made, I'd, I'd plucked up the courage to go to the doctors, not knowing what, what was wrong. Um, and at the end of it, I'll never forget the words, Martin, you, you, you've got depression. And I was like, I can't have depression. I'm, I'm, I've got a good job. I'm, I'm about to be married. I've got, you know, love. I've got, you know, children. You know, I can't have depression. It's, it, nah, I can't. Back in 2014, the stigma around depression and mental health isn't what it is today. I'll just paint a picture. Um, as I was crying, coming away from the doctors, I thought my whole life had finished. I felt alone. I felt worried. I was actually worried that day because I was I, I booked in a meeting with my area manager. Um, so I thought, I'm going to have to tell him. And I was worried, this is, this is how crazy it was, I was worried that I was going to lose my job because I had depression and that I had mental health. So that's what I was worried about. And my area manager at the time, um, when I told him, he kind of laughed it off. He's like, yeah, you can't have depression, Martin. Don't be silly. You know, just kind of man up and just get on with it. So that was, that was my first kind of, the first time that I'd spoke to anyone about it and kind of somebody was talking talking what the way I was like I can't have depression and basically we laughed it off so from that day forward I lived a double life 
and I call it a double life because on the outside I looked like Martin, but on the inside I, I literally was dying. Um, and I've been given antidepressants, but looking back, even though I was taking these tablets every day and that was sorting out the chemical imbalance, it wasn't dealing with the inner Martin and, and all the issues and all the troubles that were, you know, piling up and had been piling up. Uh, so I've been taking the taking the tablets, and basically for almost three, just over three years, I was just going deeper and deeper into a, a dark pit. Um, and for some out there, it'll be sad to hear this, but I, I was days away from taking my life. Um, depression had made me feel worthless. It, it told me that I wasn't good at my job. Um, it told me that I was a rubbish dad, a rubbish husband, a rubbish friend. Basically, I was worthless and that nobody liked me. I became a social recluse. My love and everybody knows me. I'm a massive Man United fan. I missed cup finals. I didn't go to matches. I wasn't returning text calls, which again is very unlike me. I was just basically just going deeper and deeper into a pit. Um, so I knew what I was going to do, when I was going to do it. A um, couple of days before, I'd, I'd sent photos out to my mum and my brothers with a little message telling them I loved them. And I think they knew something was up. And it was actually my brother, I think, that's probably saved my life because they were obviously talking in the background and my brother had sent me a text instead of my mum. And it had said, and I'll never forget it, because um, it's the day that it kind of put me into getting something sorted. But it was the words, do you think Martin's going to commit suicide? And for the first time, it had made me sit up and think. And that's when I knew I had to get help. I've been to the doctors lots of times and the medication had gone up and up and up and up and I was on the max possible. But that's all they were doing. They were just giving me tablets. They weren't dealing with what was going on in there. The red flags had already been kind of sounded, but the NHS told me that it would probably be six months before they could do anything for me. And I remember saying to the doctor, I'm not going to be here in six months. You know, we need to do something today. So I kind of turned my back uh, on the NHS at that time, knowing that I had to do something, um, and not really knowing where to go. So I started doing a bit of research and I came across something and, and I'd like, if, if, if people are out there today that are suffering and, and uh, this, this story is resonating, I want, I want you to write these four letters down because this again is, is why I'm here today. I researched something called EMDR therapy and I've written it down because I always get the letters muddled up. It stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing Therapy. Now, back in 2017, wasn't really known about, certainly in the UK anyway. Don't think it was available on the NHS. It was only available privately. But it was very big in the US. Uh, and at that time, it was being used for a lot of the military personnel coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq that were suffering with PTSD. And the success rate for treating PTSD was, I think, in the late 80s, early 90s percent. And they'd done some trials around treating depression and anxiety as well, and it had a similar effect. And I was really lucky. I, I put Google in and found that there was a place about an hour's drive away from where I was living in Yorkshire at the time. It wasn't cheap. It was £100 a session. And I ended up having eight sessions. But in April 2017, for the first time in a long time, I felt alive. I felt free. For the first time, there wasn't a grey cloud following me. For the first time, I felt like Martin again. Um, and that, you know, I had a future. I wasn't scared. Um, I felt, I felt for the three years previously, almost like if, you, if you're Harry Potter fans, the Dementors, that's basically what my life had felt like every day I woke up. Just the whole of my life just being sucked out of me. From there, with this new lease of life and love and just freeness, um, 
a few months earlier, uh, we'd booked tickets uh, to go and see Ariana Grande at the Emmyan Arena. And again, I think if if I'd been in the the mindset that I had been earlier, I probably wouldn't have gone, which is obviously a different story altogether. Um, but I was looking forward to it, as was my daughter. So here comes May 2017, getting ready for the arena. We'd been practicing the songs, practicing the dance moves, being a dodgy dad, you know, the dodgy dan uh, dad dancing. Um, and we all know, obviously, what happened. Um, we, we, we'd made the decision to leave the arena and the, and the concert during the encore, just so that we would we would miss the rush. A lot of people forget the concert was actually Monday night. A lot of people think that the concert was a weekend, but it wasn't, it was a Monday. And my daughter Eve was doing her mock exams. So uh, I was getting it in the ear from her mum about, you know, getting her back at a good time. So we'd made, made the decision to, to, to leave during the encore. And I think, I think that, that, that rush, obviously if I could go back in time, I probably wouldn't leave then, I probably would have stayed. But I think the fact that we were running through the city room has, has saved our lives. Uh, we've, we've been told from my police liaison officer that we actually brushed shoulders with Salman Abedi. Uh, he's the terrorist that detonated the bomb. So we've actually brushed shoulders with him. And then about four seconds after that, he detonates the bomb. Now, because we were running, that saved our lives. If we were walking, we'd have been, we'd have been right next to him. You know, so we, we, I certainly wouldn't be here today talking to you. Um, so when he detonates the bomb, uh, me and Eva are only 10 metres away. Um, I still, when, I, when I say those words, I, again, I, I still find it unbelievable that I am able to talk to you today. So I was 10 metres away. Uh, I suffered 22 shrapnel wounds. The surgeons that, and, and consultants that saved my life said it was like being shot at close blank range 22 times. So if you can imagine 22 golf ball sized holes all over my body, that was basically me. I was awake the whole time as well, um, slipping in and out of consciousness, but um, I knew I was dying. Um, I knew I wasn't in a good way. Um, obviously I was losing a lot of blood. The two, the two main injuries that I'd suffered, uh, one had hit me in the back, totally severed my spinal cord. So I've now got a T10 complete spinal injury, which in layman terms means I'm paralyzed from the belly button down. What the, the more serious injury actually was one that hit me in the side of the neck and severed two of my main arteries. Now again, uh, the, the guardian angel that was over us, uh, I'm not religious, but there was definitely somebody over us that night because th those bolts were traveling at over hundred miles an hour. And they were saying that those bolts should have gone straight through but this one went through, severed two arteries, and I swallowed it, so it ended up in my stomach. And nobody, nobody can understand how that's happened, because there were people, there were people 40, 50 metres away that unfortunately died with one injury. Uh, and there's me 10 metres away with 22 injuries. So I knew I was dying, and unfortunately I could see Eve was in a bad way. She, she'd suffered um, a really catastrophic head injury. I'd shielded her, thankfully, so I'd, I'd taken the brunt of it, uh, and I still don't know how one got through, but one did, uh, and basically entered at the temple and went straight through. Um, so I could see, obviously, she wasn't in a good way, and she was dying in front of my eyes as well. So I had an hour, basically, where I knew I wasn't going to make it. Um, it was an acceptance to the situation. Just to let everybody know, I wasn't in any pain. I wasn't in a panic. Um, I was very calm, almost an acceptance to the situation. You know, you're going to die. This is it. You've got one job to do now, and that's to ensure that he gets out and hopefully survives. That's what you've got to do now. So you've got to hang on. So my body was basically shutting down and, and telling me to close my eyes. And it was, if, if people have suffered jet lag, that, that's what it was like, basically. Just wanting to go to sleep, but fighting it. Uh, just to just to ensure that he got out. Um, I see the paramedics come to take me. Uh, I refuse. Uh, I, I say the words, "I'm not going to make it." Please take my daughter. Just so I know that at least she's at least got a chance. You know, let let that be the last thing that I do. 
And that's the last thing that I see. I see being stretched off and then that's, I'm content. I've done my job as a dad. Uh, and then that's when, for me, I, I think the curtains are coming down. And then, um, thankfully, uh, obviously, I didn't know what was happening. Mr. Sixina turned around, operated on me for 14 hours, saved my life. I was in intensive care at Salford Royal. And then I wake up uh, about a week later, um, told about what's happened and that, thankfully, I'm alive and in one piece. Um, Eve's still alive, albeit she's touch and go. She's still alive, uh, fighting for her life. And then I get told, obviously, suffered 22 shrapnel wounds. Uh, and I'm, I'm, in a, I'm in a bad way. Uh, I'll probably skip a few, a few days um, when two, two men with white coats walk in. Uh, and, I, and I know I'm going to be told something I probably don't want to hear. And though that's probably one of the only days I can remember from my time at Salford Royal, unfortunately. Um, and the words that, uh, you know, you're not going to walk again, Martin. You, you've, you've suffered a, a severed spinal cord. You're lucky to be alive. Uh, but yeah, you, you suffered a T10 spinal cord injury and uh, unfortunately you're not going to walk again. Um, and and I, think, I think the surgeons were expecting me to kick off or to cry or to scream and shout. And again, there wasn't kind of everything that I'd gone through. I was just happy to be alive. And if that means having no legs, then I'll take that, you know? Um, and, I, and I think they're still baffled by, by the way that, that I kind of took that information. It was a case of, right, you've got that out of the way. What do we do next? When does rehab start? When does physio start? And I can remember the kind of consultants looking around going, this is, this is not normally what happens. And that's just really how, how I've kind of caught with it. Um, um, told I won't walk again in a spinal unit for, for three months in Southport. Uh, and obviously at that time, Eve's in hospital. Uh, I don't want to be in hospital myself, so I think that was the motivation as well. But actually, what my family and the hospital were concerned about was obviously the mental health. What is this going to do to my is mental health? Bearing in mind what's what's gone on previously, um, but I think with what I'd learnt with the EMDR therapy, I've not had to have any mental health um, kind of visits or meetings or appointments, even since being injured. EMDR has taught me, I had a good wrestle with depression, uh, don't get me wrong, it had the better of me for a long time, but over those eight sessions, we wrestled, and finally, I controlled it, it wasn't controlling me anymore, I still live with it, it's, it, it's here with me today, it, it's watching me today, it's waiting for an opportunity to creep in, as it does, um, so it's something that I will and have, I'll learn to live with, um, so I now live and work with depression and PTSD. It's, it's just part of me now, but I control it. Uh, it doesn't control me anymore. So it doesn't tell me, you know, what to do, what to say, how to feel, how to think. I, I tell it now. I still have bad days, don't get me wrong. Uh, there's still some very dark days uh, when I'm having PTSD flashbacks, which aren't nice. Seeing Eve in, in, in the way that she was is, is a vision that I probably see daily. Um, you know, in fact, this morning I woke up at three o'clock in, in sweats, um, and that's the picture that I see it is Eve dying in front of my eyes. That it's just something I have to learn to live with now, unfortunately. So there are there are days, uh, but I've I've learned how to how to live with it. We know both myself and my wife. We know what the bad days look like. We know what to do. A lot of the time, it's just she leaves me to it. Um, she knows not to speak to me and. Um, for me, it's just about being in a room on my own um, and, yeah, just getting through it. I, I see a bad day like I have a good day, so I accept it. Um, I don't try and rationalise it. Why am I having a bad day? I just accept it like we do, like today. It's a beautiful day. I know I'm going to have a good day. It's exactly the same when I'm having a bad day. Today is going to be a bad day. I'm going to be in a bad mood. Um, yeah. And that's what I do. I just accept it and get through it and know that tomorrow is going to be another day. And I'd, I'd urge everyone to, it, it probably sounds 
silly, um, but it's not. It, it is it is that simple, uh, and I'm happy to have that talk with, with people uh, after today. Um, and there'll, there'll be ways of, that you can get in touch. Um, so yes, you know, to, to, to go through that experience of, of dying, knowing that you're going to die, accepting the situation, um, making peace with yourself. Um, like I said, you know, even though, you know, I'm paralyzed, I live every day to the max, you know, so that's why people say, I can't believe, why are you so happy, Martin? And you're getting on with life. And it's like, well, because for an hour I was dying and like, you know, to wake up, and, and, and be alive, you know, even though I've not got my legs, that's something that I'm going to take. I know there's 22 families out there that take that tomorrow. Uh, and I know they'd be the first ones to be getting on the phone to me if I wasn't living life to the full, because uh, I'm, I'm in contact with a lot of the, lot of the deceased families. Um, so, yeah, so I do a lot of, a lot of talking now because there is still a stigma around mental health. And I know us men, uh, we, we still don't talk about it enough. Um, you know, and I say I say it a lot, you know, it is okay not to be okay. Um, you know, a circle of my friends, we we have a WhatsApp group now. Um, just to throw it out there, I know they won't mind me talking about it. But if we're not feeling good, we we message each other and we tell each other and we're straight on the phone to each other. I did it a couple of weeks back. I've just said to my to my friend Carl, I'm I'm having a I'm having a rubbish day today. I don't feel good. And he was straight on the phone. What's up? What's up? Let's talk it through. And I think that's amazing. And I, and I look back at 2014, you know, I, I just wish I'd have had that at the time. You know, I, I wish I'd have had the confidence to, to tell Steve uh, or Karen or whoever it was that, you know what, I, something's going on in my head and I don't know what it is. Um, I wish I wish I could tell him to do that. Um, and that's what I want to get out today. You know, tell your friends. Tell them that you're not all right. Tell them about what's going on in your head. And, you know, you'll be surprised at, at, the, at what, what will come back, especially today. I think 2021, we're in a, we're in a different world now about mental health. It's getting better. Uh, I, still, I still think the services and, and, and the help out there isn't good, good enough. Um, but I know I think that's a case of, you know, just the number of people that are suffering with mental health. Throw a COVID pandemic into that. Um, and you know it's it's a lot worse. Um, so you know I think um, I think about that person sending pictures to my mum and my brothers and just everything that was going on in my head. And you know I look at the person on on this computer screen today, you know, telling the story, and that I'm still here to tell it. And when I say it, it feels good. You know what I mean? It feels like ah, maybe that's why I've survived. Maybe that's why I'm here today. Not that I'm religious uh, by any means, but you know, when, when I when I think about, it, I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't have survived. So maybe that's why it is. Maybe I can make a change. Maybe it is my job to talk about mental health uh, and, and get it out there and talk about my story, my journey. Uh, and if I can, if somebody's on this Zoom uh, meeting today. And it changes the way that they look at things or it makes them go to the doctors or it makes them speak to their friends about things then today's been good and that's what today's about um and then again i look at the guy now you know i've raised nine hundred thousand pounds for the spinal injuries association i was asked to be a trustee uh, so i'm a trustee now of a charity that is very close to my heart and if you saw me on tv a couple of weeks ago you'll see that I've done something really mad uh, and I'm going to be climbing Kilimanjaro uh, this September in the hope of raising a million pounds for the Spinal Injuries Association. But it's not about that today. Um, but by all means, you know, follow me. Uh, you know, I'm going to need all your help and support to get up that mountain. Uh, but what a feeling. And I think that's going to be a really emotional day for me at the top of that summit when I'm looking over at the clouds and the sun and just thinking, you know, what a journey that's been over the last six years from almost ending my life to reaching the top of one of the highest mountains in the world. What, what a day that's going to be. And what a day, not just for disabled people, but for mental health and, and everything else. It's going, to be a, it's going to be a beautiful day and I can't wait to share that with you. But like I said at the start, none of this would be possible without Salford Royal. 
uh, and I'm really delighted uh, that my beautiful friend, Karen Casper, uh, we've, we've been friends for over 30 years uh, and we lost touch for a while as you do uh, as friends. We just, we, we spoke on Facebook and, and Messenger. Uh, Karen was one of those that visited me at Salford Royal, but I have no memory of it, <laughs> which is probably a good thing. <laughs> yeah. like, God knows what I was saying at the time, being on all the drugs. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't be here without Salford Royal. So Salford Royal is a very, a very special place for me. And uh, whenever Karen rings me to ask me to do something, I always say, you never need to ask, I'm there. So I do a lot of motivational talking at Salford Royal for the, for the doctors and nurses, uh, especially in, in current climate, um, uh, because I, I owe them my life. So what I'd like to do now is hand over to Karen Casper, who is the fundraising officer uh, from North Kerr Charity. She's going to tell you a bit about what they do and why she needs your cash. Uh, so uh, over to you, Karen, and, and thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, can I just say, first of all, a bit like you said, Martin, thank you for the platform today because we're a brand new charity with a new brand and a name. So thank you to Steve, Michelle Durs and Pro Manchester, and of course, Martin. So thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Um, so, I work for North Care Charity, which is the NHS charity for um, Bury, Old Dun, Rochdale, and of course Salford, which obviously is close to Martin's heart. And um, so we cover the hospitals and um, the care organisations as well. Um, just a bit about me and Martin, like Martin just referenced, we went to school together quite a bit of time ago now. Um, and we were on Facebook on social media and I found out what happened to Martin um, and I just had to go to Salford to see him. Kind of say at that point, I actually wasn't in this job. I was, wasn't in fundraising at all. I was actually a textile designer. So I went to Salford a couple of times to see Martin and then when he was in his final hospital in, in Southport as well, wasn't it, Martin? Um, and then we're friends ever since now. We've just got a different relationship, haven't we, Martin? It's just amazing. So from something really negative, we've got something really positive going on. Um, so yeah, that's me and Martin's relationship. So one of the first things I did when I started at Salford Royal, um, that's where I'm based, um, it was last January. Um, I actually wanted to walk around the wards to see the clinicians and the nursing staff and, and talk and chat to them about you know, what they needed. Um, and I'll be really honest, it was quite alarming. Um, for example, their staff rooms were awful to say the least you know they've got chairs in there that have been recycled and recycled and recycled again um really dire atmosphere and, and considering they only get a small amount of time in the day for some downtime the rooms were just really uninspiring um, and it really touched me um and luckily and um, through the Sir Tom donations through NHS Charity Together one of the projects I've been working on is actually refurbishing a lot of those staff rooms across the site um, and the difference that that has made because sometimes it's not just about the equipment um, or researchers or research sometimes it's about the simple things that the NHS can't provide so the charity actually tries to provide as much as possible um, things that the NHS can't provide so we go kind of above and beyond what the NHS can provide so for me personally from when I first started to see these staff rooms that were awful um, I actually last week went to actually see some of them that have been up updated and refurbed and the difference that has made to staff is unbelievable. So, so, you know, we're talking about well-being today and mental health. You know, those staff rooms now have made such a difference to them. Um, another thing as well, which we were able to do, which is what I'm quite proud of working on, is critical care unit, actually, where Martin was. Um, it's quite dark in there and depressing, like a lot of the wards are. And we've been able to um, fund 48 ceiling tiles, um, which are illuminate. So it kind of like brings the outside inside and the difference that they've made as well. We've literally only been able to install, I think it's six because of um, COVID and all the pods were being used with COVID patients. But actually we're in a position now we can actually, um, I think it's about another four pods we can do over the next few weeks. But just those six tiles that went up, the feedback that I got was unbelievable. Just putting smiles on those clinicians and, you know, medical staff's faces has been like wonderful. Um, so it's kind of this Tom money that we've been using at the moment because we've not got any events going on. Um, so I'm kind of like reaching out today to anybody 
um, that will be able to support the charity in any way. Sometimes it's not about, you know, just the checkbook and the funds, which obviously is amazing because without that, we can't actually provide, you know, the equipment, research, education. Um, but it's about support in lots of different ways. So it could be the, some knowledge that you've got, experience, networking, which we know is you know, so important, um, sharing. So for example, I mentioned with quite you know, a new charity, I think we've got something like 70 followers on Instagram. So you know, even if you can just you know, share our social media handles, that would be amazing. Um, perhaps you know, the, the company you work for could be you know, select us as charity of the year maybe, um, and, you know, we're talking about Salford, but like I've covered, we do, we do Fairfield, um, Oldham and Rochdale as well. So maybe you've got connections to those hospitals, um, maybe sponsor an event. Hopefully when, you know, COVID's gone, we can do more face to face events. Um, so it's kind of just reaching out today just to see whether anybody be able to help. I think um, the post literature that's going out after today is going to have my contact details because we've not actually got the website up and running yet, but you'll be able to reach out via my mobile number or um, email address if that's okay um, so yeah that's basically who we are and what you know what I'm doing um, absolutely passionate about what, about what I do um, I think it's about just giving back sometimes and it doesn't have to be the big gestures it's just the small gestures that, that make such a big difference um, you know just for example yesterday um, a little girl called Freya she's only 10 years old and um, about three times a year, normally Christmas, Halloween and Easter, she kind of does her own little appeal. And at Christmas time, she brought in 50 selection boxes for our children's panda unit. And when I met her yesterday, she brought in 50 Easter eggs. And the thing about Freya is why she's so inspiring. Not only she's just 10 years old, you know, she was showing me her operation scars. She's constantly got, you know, medical issues herself, but yet she's willing to help other children that are less fortunate. And it's that kind of thing that I just think, you know what, wow, if she can do that, then I'm sure all of us can just add something, you know, and, and come together as teamwork and help. So yeah, so just if anybody, you know, like I said, it doesn't have to be about money, it can be any kind of support for us, then please do get in touch. Thank you. Lovely, Sorry lovely. About yeah, I'm going to say a bit nervous about this. It's my first kind of like webinar I've presented. I'm normally like on the other end just listening. So oh, don't say that, Karen. Like, you were perfect. Talking. You were perfect. <laughs> Pitch perfect. Well done. And then, and, you know, Manchester is very famous for its community spirit and, uh, you know, getting around people. So uh, I'm confident that uh, Pro Manchester and the team will get behind uh, North Care and uh, be helpful. So we, we're Thank at you, the point now where we, we're going to uh, open up for questions. Um, uh, and these could be questions for Karen or for Martin um, uh, that you might be uh, interested in uh, asking about. Uh, obviously, Martin's covered a lot of ground about, uh, you know, being a, a survivor of uh, mental health issues himself. Obviously, you've got the, uh, the terrorist attack and uh, maybe, you've, maybe you've got a friend who you might, might need some advice about. Uh, so everything's on the table. The idea is that, as Martin said, that a few of you might uh, go away having be a bit better than you were when you joined the call. And obviously, uh, Karen's obviously hopefully spiked your interest about how you might support the NHS. So questions for, uh, for both of those. We've got a couple, got a couple already, but how, how about if we uh, open it up first? I don't know if the mics are open, uh, but could we see if there's any questions? Yeah, any, anybody can ask anything. Like I say, there, there, there's no filter. So, what, you know, if, if, if whatever you want to ask, feel free. If, if people are, I just think about the Martin in uh, 2014, I, I probably wouldn't have put my hand up and, and asked a question. Uh, so I'm going to pass on my mobile number and my social media uh, profiles as well. So if people want to get in touch afterwards, I'm, I'm happy to have that one-to-one -one as well. Uh, so don't, don't, don't be afraid you know, of going away today and, and not speaking. I, I will speak to anybody that wants to speak to me after this event. Uh, so get in touch. But if anyone's got a question now, I, I will answer on anything. Uh Martin, it's, it's it's Mark Campbell here. I do, first of all, I just like to say thank you. I mean, your your story is um, completely inspiring and uh, really humbling, actually, to be honest. And I think um, just you know, people talking about their mental health alone is is a real challenge for us. Um, it, it, as 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 you know, as a country, as a nation, and 
you know, probably as a population across the world, to be honest. Um, and then everything you've suffered as well is just um, it, it, extraordinary, really. Um, but I, I suppose that one of the questions I've got is actually around your daughter's mental health and how she's coped with all of this, because for someone who's so young, it must have been you know, quite a horrific sort of uh, experience to have gone through and you know, a real challenge uh, every day as well, I assume. For, for, for sure. Um... Yeah, it, it's a good question, and 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 if and if you if you type my name in Google, there'll be literally everything about me. But if you type in Eve's name, there's nothing, and we've been very strict on that. You know, we we didn't want her to be in the media. I'm, I'm happy to answer your question, uh, but you, a lot of people won't know she she suffered a, a catastrophic brain injury. Um, she's actually the only person in the world to survive that injury. Uh, and we've, we've recently found out that had she been a soldier, that had just left her because you just don't survive that injury. Um, so they've actually written a paper on her uh, about what they did in terms of treating her. Uh, and again, we, we've, I found out recently that uh, the coroner was actually ringing Eve's ward every day because they thought she was going to be number 23. Uh, so that's how close she was. So, yeah, so the fact that she's suffered a, a catastrophic brain injury uh, brings its own mental health issues. Uh, so she she suffers on a daily basis, and, and that is unfortunately something that you know drugs won't control. Uh, unfortunately, she she has you know uh, a lot of therapists uh, because she she was you know she's only been talking again for twelve months. She was mute uh, for, for for when she when she woke up to basically. Uh, I, I was in Australia at the time when, when she started talking again. She started talking at the back end of 2019. She was she was mute for two years because of the trauma. And then I again I put her in touch through Mr. Saxena, uh, my neurosurgeon, because I said I could I could feel her going backwards. Um, and obviously, you know, she she wasn't talking about it. She was keeping it all in. So again, from my journey, I knew that she had to she had to get it out. Uh, and um, lo and behold, she, she goes for the therapy sessions and then within a couple of weeks, she's talking. So it just shows you the power of it. Um, but she's back at school now. She goes to a different school. So she's, again, it, there must be something in our blood because uh, she's, uh, again, the, the medical book went out of the window with Eve as well. So she was, she's back at school full time and, uh, I'll share with you that she took some unassisted steps a couple of weeks ago as well, which was amazing. So, you know, fingers crossed. It's She'll need care for the rest of her life. Uh, and, you know, it's it's going to be a rough road for her. But, uh, you know, I, I tell her daily, you know, that she can do whatever she wants to do. You know, she has to reach for the stars um, and not accept what people say that she can do. You know, people, even when I was injured, you know, you're not gonna walk, you're not gonna stand up, you're not gonna move your legs. You won't be able to drive your Range Rover Sport. You won't be able to do this, that, and the other. Well, I'm driving a Range Rover Sport. And if people saw the uh, uh, that I did in Australia, even Mr. Saxena was blown away when I showed him standing up, moving my legs, doing leg curls on a, in a gym. So it's just about believing, and and you know if, if if you believe what people tell you, then you'll you'll probably go along with that. But it's just kind of you know looking outside those boxes, and 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 kind of going for it. And I'm I'm living proof of that. Um, so yeah, so that's what I tell Eve. Really, it, it's it's tough, and and she has a bad days as well. But it's just getting through them. You know what I mean? And, and love. I know it's a cliche, but love, friendship, support understanding education it's all it's, it's all there it's just knowing it and I think like I say I look at I look at the Martin in 2014 and all alone nobody to talk to you know it was just a totally different person to the one that's with you today and, and that's what I ask everybody to do just talk about it whether it's to me to your doctor to your friend to your wife that that's the first step and when you do that everything changes it really does. Martin, there's a couple of questions on the yeah. chat um, uh, th th about small things, I think, uh, yeah. about uh, Katie's asking about uh, small things that you do to help yourself. That Because that, um, 
you know, some of the things you're talking about might be unique to your circumstances. But what are the small things that you find helpful? It can be really, uh, and obviously everyone's different. Like I, I'm a, a film buff. So, um, you know, film is, you know, films is something that I've done from, you know, God, probably four or five, you know what I mean? So I can literally, uh, to the anger of my wife, I can literally sit in a room and watch four or five films back to back. Uh, and that's what I do. Uh, I, I do things that I love. Uh, it might be, uh, and Steve will laugh, it might be watching reruns of, you know, The Treble in 99 and because I was there. Just just evoking, you know, happy memories when I got married. When, when I did the um, EMDR therapy, one of the things that I did was, you know, you, you think about a time when you felt your most happiest and the most happiest time other than when I had Eve, was actually on my honeymoon. Um, and when I think about that time, you know, that was uh, the, the year that I was diagnosed with depression. So it was 2014. Um, but yeah, that I was in St. Lucia in a, in a beautiful resort. And yeah, it, like even now I, I close my eyes and that's what I do. I close my eyes and I just think about what we talked about during the therapy sessions like the, the sand and the sea going through my feet, the heat on, on my face and my back, just the, the love being with my wife, copious amounts of food and drink because <laughs> it was an all inclusive. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just thinking about hap happy thoughts and, and doing things that take your mind off those dark moments. Um, but as well, it's accepting the situation so not what I'm not saying is putting it to the back of your mind like I did initially. You know, I, I can sit and watch a film now because I know I've got a clear mind. Would I be able to do that in 2014? Definitely not. I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to sit in a dark room. I didn't, you know, somebody ringing me was a hassle. You know what I mean? So it's just doing things that you enjoy, whether that's going for a walk, running, picking flowers, whatever it is, it's just doing something that you love. So that, that's what I'd say uh, to that. Do you mind if I add something to it, Martin? Because I've, I've obviously been, been your pal for a long time. But you said to me once that uh, in your darkest times, you'd kind of uh, think, uh, well, no, no one no one cares about me. I just, uh, look, my phone's not ringing. No one's, bother it. Not, no one's bothering with, with me. And uh, you told me, and I didn't realise this, but the smallest text of, Hi, how are you doing? Was so important to you at that moment yeah. in your life no, I don't think uh, from, from friends and so on. So yeah. there's something small things that people can do to help people who are perhaps they're concerned about, isn't it? You can, yeah. you can reach exactly. out. To. You know, for, for the managers that are on here today, maybe senior executives, you know, if you had somebody like Martin come to you, like I did in 2014, what would you do, honestly? You know what I mean? Are there... You know, do you know how to signpost somebody? Do you, do you know what to do? Or would you laugh it off like my area manager did and, and tell me that I'm, I'm stupid and that, you know, I, I haven't got depression? Do you know what I mean? So that, that's an honest question to ask yourself today. If you're in a position of seniority and, and, and people in your care come to you, which would take a lot of guts, would you be able to direct somebody in the right way? Would you be able to say the right things? Or would you, would you laugh it off and maybe make a... Uh, a situation more deadly um, so that that's maybe an honest question for everybody to ask themselves today uh, or if you've seen one of your friends not come to the football like I didn't which you know I've never missed again you know if, if, if your friends are not returning text picking up the calls you know um, not turning into work you know people know me like my appearance my hair the way that I look, you know what I mean? It was very, very, things to me. So the fact that I would turn up and not do my hair or, you know, I wouldn't have a, you know, a, a shirt and tie, you know, it's just, it just wasn't me. So if, if, if you see a change in somebody, pull them to one side and just say, look, you know, I'm worried about you. What, you know, is everything okay? And, and that will mean the world. I just, like I say, if, I just wish I'd, a, I'd a, had the courage to speak to Steve at that time or to any of my friends at that time because I know what they would have said. Do you know what I mean? They would have, they would have helped me. Uh, and I, I say I, I get very emotional about it, you know, the, because uh, it was a very easy thing to do. Uh, and I know Steve was upset when I told him it, uh, the, the first time that, 
you know, because nobody knew. I, I put a I put a mask on. Do you know what I mean? I'd put my my suit and tie on, and I'd go to work, and I'd go into private banking manager mode, and that was it. You know what I mean? But inside, I was I was dying, and and nobody saw that. You know. Um, so yeah, just just text somebody today and ask them how they're doing, and you you might be surprised at what comes back. There's quite a, a powerful question from Jill on the chat, um, Martin, right, okay. asking about. Um, you know what? What's the point of uh, you know if you if your life doesn't appear to have enough value? Did you ever have any of those thoughts? And and, and how yeah, did you how yeah. did you deal with that? Yeah, I said. I mean, again, what I'll probably do, Jill, I'll, I'll probably pick up with you uh, afterwards, uh, and, and we'll talk. Um, but as I say, I think that 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 message that you've put on there, I won't share it. But you know that that that's like me in 2014. So the, there's an alarm bell there for me. So. You know, really, you know, applaud the courage for doing that. That that will have taken a lot to, to ask that. So that today is the first day, Jill, of getting better, and we'll do that together. Um, but yeah, I, I felt I felt worthless. Um, you know, I, I have I have a regret actually. De depression told me I wasn't good at my job, and I, and I quit my job in private banking because of depression, and it, and it's one of my regrets because Steve probably won't admit it, but I, I was good at it, <laughs> and I loved it. And uh, it, it's it's one of my regrets that I'll probably have uh, until the day that I die because pri Steve knows but private banking was was everything to me and uh, a lot of my clients came to my wedding and uh, it, it private banking and me was a match made in heaven. Uh, I always said to Steve, I, I was paid for talking, so Steve knows I love talking. So to get paid for it was amazing. I've noticed, Martin. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's it's one of the regrets. Pri depression told me that I wasn't good at my job. And uh, and yeah, I'll have to live with that, unfortunately. Um, but that's what depression what, does. What's fascinating about that, Martin, is that I know because I worked with you at the time, you were you were highly thought of. It was it was almost a disaster when you decided you wanted to move on. It's just amazing the different perception that you can have I if uh, you know I that what know. what your mind can do to. And, and, and everybody was telling me I was wrong, but depression was telling me it was like well they're lying. They're just they're just saying that, Martin. You know, you're not you're not good at your job. You're rubbish. Your friends don't like you. I, I couldn't like you know, and you'll know, and, and people will know. You know, to, to pick up a phone and 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 talk to people, it's a hard thing to do. But I love it. You know what I mean? It's something that comes natural to me. Um, so for me, not to pick up a phone is a is a is a big thing. And I just I, I couldn't do it. The phone would ring, and I I just didn't have the energy to do it to to talk. And and I just I, I look at myself back there, and I was oh. You know what I mean? I just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't cope with it, Steve. It was, um, yeah, it was, it, the only way out was to end it. And, and, and I, ju I just felt you know, the depression was telling me that everybody would be better off without me. Uh, and yeah, I, I was two days away. You know, that's how, that's how close I was. Two days away from, from doing it. And, uh, you know, to see so send happened, that text, send that text, folks. Tell someone yeah. you love them. It's important. So yeah, Jill, uh, we'll we'll catch up afterwards. So thank you for that. We'll we'll catch up and we'll uh, we'll we'll meet up. Obviously, I know COVID and stuff, but we'll 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 get that sorted. So don't worry. Right. So we've got. I'm conscious of time. We've got about five minutes left. So if you've got, uh, obviously, Martin's keen to, and we'll pick up with people afterwards if uh, if they if they would like to do that. But maybe you've got a question for Karen. Maybe you can help Karen. Maybe you've got you know 74 Instagram followers. Maybe you've got a marketing team that can help Karen maybe yeah. uh any fair, questions I was going to say Steve Karen? a couple of people have reached out already which is lovely so lovely. thank you so much yeah okay perfect okay um so Becky's uh Becky Stalker hi Becky I can see you on my screen uh she's asking about e EMDR Martin right. uh, is that available today or is it only available pri privately and no, uh, it, do you have any good, is, good links yeah it, it is available today uh the NHS have adopted it um what I would say like I said in my uh talk it's available, but it's it's how quickly you can get it readily available. Um, so with the pandemic and things like that, you know what I mean. Whether you will be able to get it today, I don't know. Um, so what I what I say to all my friends and, and when I'm doing my motivational talks, if if you can afford it, go private because you'll be able to get you'll be able to get it today. And uh, I've 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 referred 
lots of people to it. Um, and again, the feedback that they get is just amazing. So I know £100 a lot of money, uh, but for me, you know, if it was a thousand pounds a session, I would pay it. You know, that that's how you know it saved my life. It it changed my life. It allowed me to be Martin again and, and the person that you see in front of me. Um uh, so yeah, I can share a link. Um, but I think if you type in uh, EMDR therapy near me on Google, it will come up. If you go private, just make sure that they are accredited to give it. Uh, and that they just don't kind of talk around it. So make sure that they are, um, you know, practitioners of EMDR therapy. Okay. Uh, has anybody got any final questions then for Martin? Or Karen, of course. Right, well, um, feels like we're at an actual pause there. So uh, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, massive thank you to uh, uh, Martin and Karen for coming along. Thank you very much uh, to uh, both of you. That's um, been really inspiring. And uh, of course, I know you're inspiring because you're my pal and I love <laughs> your loads. Uh, but equally, um, I, I hope that um, from today that the uh, people on the call can think about how they can reach out to another person, pay it forward almost uh, from, from this meeting. And Martin's available. I think Sean's going to perhaps send some stuff out in the pack afterwards if anybody wants to, to reconnect. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and just finally, a huge thank you to, to yourself, Steve, and to Schroeder's uh, Personal Wealth for supporting this uh, really important and inspiring event. So thank you and, and thank you to everyone for attending. Um, I also note that Becky uh, works for one of Pro Manchester members, Leonard Cheshire Disability Charity. Uh, I'm going to do an intro into yourself, Karen um, and Becky, because yeah. she's just mentioned uh, about getting in touch with you. So, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. OK, hopefully that was a good morning. Enjoy it, everyone. Enjoy the sun. Everyone. And Jill, I will be in contact. Thank you.